Hello, everybody. Good morning. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. I'm so glad you're here today. Uh, I, it's cold, y'all. I had no idea that, I, that this many people were going to come to church this morning. Thank you. God bless you. I was pretty sure it was going to be me talking to the Kalachi salesman today. Uh, so I'm thrilled to see all of you. If this is your first time joining us, this is The Gathering. This is a new place for new people, and I'm Lance. I'll be your major D for this experience. I'm one of the junior varsity pastors here at First United Methodist Church of Fort Worth. Uh, so I'm glad that you've joined us. We are in a Christmas season right now called Advent, which is a season of preparation, preparing for the coming of the King that happens on Christmas Day. Uh, before we get going, I want to make a couple special announcements. One, when you came in, there were a couple different things in your seats when you sat down. Uh, the first thing is an attendance card. Whether this is your first time or your thousandth time, I ask that you make note of your attendance. Uh, I'm a real data-driven kind of person, and just knowing who's making it and when helps us make sure that the things we do are the things that you want to engage with. Uh, if you're a first-time person and you give me your contact information, all that happens is you get added to an email list. I promise I won't troll you. Uh, so in just a second, some baskets are going to come around, and uh, these attendance cards are placed in the baskets. Also, the baskets receive our tithes and offerings. Part of the commitment of the Christian community is to support God's work in the world through the church. Some of us give through cash and checks into the basket. Some of us give online. If you're one of the people that gives online, please just put that marker in the card to let other people in the community know uh, how much we're giving and supporting the church. I'd really appreciate it. It's particularly important when we have our kids with us in worship so that they get a chance to see. You know, it's awkward when you give really sacrificially online, but the basket kind of just gets passed. So uh, it's a way to make sure that we're making uh, note of our giving. I appreciate you doing that. Also, uh, as I mentioned last week, Christmas is the season where um, pretty much every church collects about 25% of its operating budget for the entire year. So if you're part of the community that's really reflecting on how it is that you're going to be a part of God's work in the world through the mission of this church and you're considering it, uh, I just want to let you know this was an amazing year of ministry in this church. It was a year of growth. It was a year of new baptisms. It was a year of new opportunities, new open doors, of which the gathering is one of the big success stories. So for all of you who reached down deep last year and created the resources for something like this to happen, thank you. Uh, it's because of your giving, it's because of your foresight, it's because of your willingness to trust that we were able to listen to the Holy Spirit and create something like this that can pack a room uh, at 9.30 on the coldest morning of the entire year. So uh, God bless you all for all of your support. That's coming around right now. Uh, also want to make note of uh, the schedule that's coming up, if I can hand that right there. Uh, so this is Sunday the 18th, is that right? Uh, so Christmas Eve is Saturday. Uh, Christmas Eve is one of the biggest days of worship here at the church. And I want to give you the schedule of what Christmas Eve worship looks like. So the first Christmas Eve service, all services are going to be in the sanctuary. The first one happens at noon. Uh, if you're the kind of person that likes calm. And if you're like the kind of person who likes to come and you like to have four family members meeting three other family members and then meeting five other family members and you all want to be able to sit together, noon. <laughs> is a great time to do that. Uh, I really suggest it. It's going to be a traditional service. Uh, three o'clock and five o'clock are children's services. So uh, how many of y'all have elementary aged kids or younger in this community? So you're probably familiar with those. If you've ever gone to children's first worship, it's just like that. There's kids leading it. There's puppets. There's family sing-alongs. It's really cool. There's crayons in the aisles. It's, there's very scary candles. Uh, that are passed out. If you're the kind of person who likes living on the edge with fire, that's a great service to go to. Uh, those are at three, that never, never more do we light the candles and then put them out than at the three and five o'clock services. Uh, the three o'clock service is crowded. The five o'clock service is insane. Uh, so if you're the kind of person who likes showing up late and not knowing if you're going to get a seat or not, the five o'clock service is for you. Uh, let me recommend 15 to 20 minutes early. I want to be really honest. It's like one of the great things about Christmas Eve is a whole bunch of people who don't normally attend us and worship join, and that's excellent. That's exactly why we have so many services. But if you show up at the time the service is or five minutes late because that's what it took your family to get out the door and get parked, it's really hard to sit. So please let me encourage you to have a time of stress and lack of worry. Get there as early as you possibly can. If you want to come with kids, 3 o'clock is going to be less stressful than 5 o'clock. 7 and 9 o'clock resume the traditional services. 7 o'clock will be busier. Uh, 9 o'clock is not crowded at all. It's another service that you can come in and sit with your family really easy. 11 o'clock, everyone's a little loose. <laughs> the singing's really good at the 11 o'clock service usually. 
Uh, that's a really fun one. I'm going to be part of the leadership in the 7, the 9, and the 11 o'clock services. Uh, so I'm going to be here all day with my family. I hope that you join us. Christmas Eve at this church is truly remarkable. There's very few places that you can get more in touch with the Christmas spirit than with the organ and the choir and the candles and the singing. Christmas Eve at First Church is truly special. So also, if you have a family uh, that you don't, doesn't have a place to go to church on Christmas Eve, that's the way, place to do it. So this year, Christmas Day falls on a Sunday, so we're going to have Christmas Day worship, uh, again, in the sanctuary. However, we are only going to have one service for the entire church on Christmas Day. No uh, 1111 service, no 830 Disciple Church service, no gathering. So the only service on Christmas Day is going to be 11 o'clock in the sanctuary. New Year's Day, the following week, is the following Sunday. Uh, also the same situation, only one service on, uh, at 11 o'clock in the sanctuary. So, is there a gathering on Christmas Day or New Year's Day? No. No. Rest. Um, I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to getting a chance to catch up a little bit. Um, So, that'll be a great opportunity for me to catch up. I'll be with you in worship in the sanctuary on those days. Uh, So, if you come and join us, I hope you do. That's where worship is going to be. And then the gathering is going to kick back up with a full head of steam, ready to start the new year beginning on January 8th with the new sermon series. We're going to spend seven weeks going through the book of Revelation. Uh, And this is something I've been talking about a whole lot and trying to make sure people know about because Revelation is a very interesting book that requires a lot of digging into. There's a reason it doesn't get used in worship a whole bunch is because you have to spend so much time explaining the background and explaining what the genre is like and explaining the context of the situation in which it was written and how the original audiences received it. I want to make sure that you come to the first couple ones because you're really going to need that to help feel comfortable and engaged. Um, There's three responses I've gotten when I've told people that I'm going to be teaching on Revelation for two months. And the first one is, awesome, that sounds really cool and interesting. And to that I say, I like you, thank you. Uh, The other response is, that sounds scary and awful. And to you, I would say, I understand, and it's not. Uh, If you're one of those people who's come to the understanding that Revelation is, uh, is only a book of coded imagery about the end of the world that radio preachers can use to buy billboards, let me tell you, it's something very different. Uh, Revelation is a book, it's a genre called Apocalypse. What it's really about is how to live faithfully and follow Jesus Christ in the midst of a world that has very different values. Uh, So for the third group of people, the number one response that they say is, I've gone to Bible studies and stuff about Revelation, and it was all really boring and didn't seem to apply. To those people, I would like to say, the more I've studied Revelation, uh, the more I've realized it's one of the most deeply applicable, creative, encouraging, challenging books in the entire Bible. It's quickly becoming one that I think speaks to me really loudly on one of the core issues in my life, which is how do I follow Jesus in the midst of a world that is so very different than him? It answers that question over and over and over again. It challenges me. It makes me think. Ultimately, it gives me hope and faith and love and trust in God. So I hope that you join us. In the the course of Revelation and that study, we're going to be looking at something that a lot of people think is scary or difficult or not applicable, and we're going to make it something that you understand, something that you know, and something that actually helps encourage you in your life of following Jesus. That's what the gathering is all about. So that starts on January 8th. I hope that you join us. Now we're going to get started in the way that we start all the way through Advent, and that is with the lighting of the Advent wreath. Uh, Each week when we do this, we have a liturgy that's led by some members of our community. I, I, this is all I can give you. Um, so keep coming forward. Uh, Courtney, our liturgist, has been reading every week. Kelly's been lighting the Advent candle. Uh, each one of the candles has a specific theme that guides us in our worship. At the end, if you would all join Courtney's lead and say amen when she's done. Now, let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Oh God, in this time of worship, may we be open to your promises, your love, and your transformation. May we vision and dream May we be surprised. May we receive the, the life you give us. May we encounter Emmanuel, God with us. We light this third candle today in a spirit of joy, joy at your presence, God, and at your work in our lives. May we live with hearts filled by your grace, and may we shine the light of that grace to the world. Amen. Thank you.
to see the rump a bum bum Our finest gifts we bring the rump a bum bum Rump a bum bum Rump a bum bum From now, perhaps we'll see our final day of glory. Say the day. Can I ask a question for those of you who were around then? <laughs> was it weird to see David Bowie and Bing Crosby together at the time? <laughs> was that, is that just something that got weirder over the ages, or was that weird day one? <laughs> okay, good to know. I wasn't sure. I was like, maybe that was natural back then. <laughs> um. Uh, one of the things that we do every time we gather together is lift our, God, our voices to God in prayer. Uh, we do that through something we call prayers of the people. It's an opportunity for us to speak together, to hear together, to go to God together. Uh, we do that through what we call prayers of the people, and it features a chance for you to speak up at a few times. One, um, I'm going to say at multiple points, Lord, in your mercy, and you all respond, hear our prayer. Let's try it. Lord, in your mercy. Uh, I'm going to lead us in a prayer of confession, uh, then a Trinitarian prayer, creator, redeemer, and sustainer. And then uh, we'll lift up some individual names, and I'll say, are there any others? And when I say, are there any others, that's your chance to lift up some names. Lift up some names of people uh, who have special joys in their life that need to be brought to God and celebrated. Names of people that have special troubles in their life, uh, special suffering, special fear, special pain. uh, And in solidarity with them, we lift up their names knowing that they need an extra measure of God's grace with them. Now, together. The people of God, gathered in the house of God, filled by the Spirit of God. Let us pray. O God, we are easily distracted and slightly jaded and cannot believe Christ is almost here. There are still presents to be bought, never mind wrapped. There are parties to attend, cookies to be baked, trees to be trimmed. Sometimes we cannot wait until this is all over. Where is the time to sit, to sleep? We can get so caught up in all that is around us that we miss the gift of the season is meant to be. We have heard the scriptures and the stories so often that they become white noise. For our frenetic pace, for our exhaustion, for our tunnel vision, for our missing the wonder and awe of a baby born to fulfill promises made long ago, forgive us. Restore to us the sense of surprise that you came to us as a little baby, unexpected yet longed for. God of the visioners and dreamers, May we always be ready to receive your gifts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Creator God, you made this world and called it good, and at no point is it easier for us to witness the goodness of your creation than this, the Christmas season. God, in the midst of darkness, you gave us light. In the midst of cold, you gave us warmth. In the midst of feeling lost, you gave us you. Lord, in your mercy, 
hear our prayers. God, at the same time, we still live in a world full of alienation, sin, and death. We still live in a world that's capable of ignoring, ignoring you, rejecting you, running away from you, a world that sometimes chooses the darkness over the light, chooses the cold over the warmth. It's in the midst of this that God that you gave us yourself, Jesus, the Redeemer, to draw us closer to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. God, as we desire to be your people in the world, it's not easy. There are so many opportunities to turn away, to close our eyes, to close our hearts. God, fill us with the power and presence of your Holy Spirit to sustain us as we go about your business and who you bring us to. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For Michaela Davidson, Lord, in your mercy. For young Jasper, Lord, in your mercy. For Martin, Lord, in your mercy. For Chance, Lord, in your mercy. Are there any others? Lord, in your mercy. 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 God, for the voices that we speak and those that we hold tight in the silence of our hearts, we come to you, knowing that in the dark midwinter, you are here, the source of our light, the source of our warmth, the source of our life, the source of our hope. Guide us, keep us, and let us know your peace and your presence, and Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Christians live always in Advent in the expectation of the future of Christ. And uh, uh, the admonition in the New Testament is not pray, but pray and watch. Pray and watch. Uh, so you must pray with open ears. Uh, open ears uh, and open eyes to watch uh, the signs of Christ coming. And what should we look for? Uh, not for uh, catastrophes. Mm. I find, I found uh, sometimes in the south of the United States, uh, Christ is coming, expect earthquakes, diseases, etc. No, <laughs> uh, I expect miracles, the miracles of the kingdom. What would a miracle look like? Uh, the unexpected. Uh, if you don't expect the unexpected, you will not find it. We, uh, uh, we don't expect the miracles, and therefore we don't see them. They are all around us.
So for those of you who are joining us uh, for the first time this Sunday, welcome. I'm very glad you're here. Uh, there's a couple things you need to know about the gathering. Uh, one is that we do a lot of real heavy engagement with the Bible. So uh, once you decide that this is your home community, that the, ga- the gathering is something you want to be a part of regularly, I encourage you to start bringing your own Bible because people will make notes uh, and things like that. If you don't have your Bible with you, that's fine. Uh, we have a stack of extra ones in the back. It's important that you have one. If you didn't grab one already, uh, Courtney is a trained Bible passer outer. If you would just signal to her as she's walking up and down the aisles, she'll make sure to get one over to you. Uh, For those of you who have your own, we're going to be in Isaiah 9 in just a little bit. If you want to go ahead and turn over to that, it's page 530. And if you have the red pew Bible, uh, we're going to get going in just a minute. So that's one of the things that we do in the gathering really regularly. Another thing that we do here that is a little more unorthodox that you might not have experienced before in a worship service is that there's actually going to be occasions where I kind of crowdsource some portions of what it is that we're talking about or actually ask questions that I intend for some of you to answer. Uh, And it's not just all rhetorical preaching up here. Um, There's actually some questions that I need some help with, and we're going to start out the message today with just that. Before we get into the scripture, there's a couple of things that I need help uh, outlining. So first, I really want to get everyone in the Christmas spirit, right? This is a, this is a, this, it's a cold day, it's dreary, uh, we really want everyone to be full of light and love and happiness and hope and Christmas feelings. So let's start out with a real uplifting question. What are the problems in the world? <laughs> Seriously, what are, what are the, when we talk about like the problems in the world, what are the problems in the world? Racism, absolutely. Another one, greed. It's funny that I heard greed and poverty at the same time disease, violence, more, war, systemic violence, authorized violence, next, apathy drugs, what another interesting, abuse period just abusive behavior abusive words abusive medicines abuse all these things is meant to heal yeah one more grief loss pain hopelessness despair doubt grief despair hopelessness aren't you guys glad you came today <laughs> this is good news all right so imagine you're walking on Sundance Square, uh, and you very bundled up, and you meet somebody who's who's uh, come from an entirely different part of the world, and they ask you, "I'm sorry, this is this is uh, this is odd, but I ran into you on the street, and you just look so friendly, and I've heard about Texans and how nice they are, so I wanted to ask you, what is this Christmas season all about? What are the themes of this Christmas season? Like, and I don't mean the story of the baby Jesus, but you're good Christians, you come to the gathering, of course you tell them that, we understand." Um, but what are the themes? What's the spirit? What, we talk about the Christmas spirit and the themes of Christmas. What's this all about? Ultimately, what's Christmas all about? Hope. The season of hope. Joy. Expectation. Oh, hold on. Expectation. Um, and I love, like, expectation, like, that something good will happen. Like, it's not just expectation is, like, dread. Like, it's expectation. Like, we, we lost last week. This week, we win. <laughs> right? <laughs> Family. And then there were some that were, that, were, that were yelled out that I missed. What were they? Love. Giving was another one I think I heard, right? Generosity. Generosity. Celebration. We got room for one more. Happiness. Oh my gosh. Isn't it amazing? We look at, like, what are the core problems in the world? Like, the things that torture us, the things that tear us apart, the things that make us want to retreat, the things that make us want to give up. We have a season. We have this whole time centered around God, and it's directly solving or addressing every single one of those problems. Do you find that fascinating? I find that fascinating. So uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, what, what it's like to, to look at the Christian story. 
So one of the things that really just has me in love with the Bible, it has me in love with our faith, it has me in love with the church, the stories that we tell, the work of God in our midst, is that it's so multifaceted, right? You can't ever get it. You can't ever have heard every possible take, right? You can't have ever heard, you can't perfectly understand anything totally and completely. There's always more to the story. There's always another level. There's always something else to learn. There's always another message. There's another chance to grow, right? Uh, like for example, one of my favorite things uh, to, to talk about, to teach Bible studies about, to think about, and to preach about is uh, what's the Sunday before Easter called? Palm Sunday, right? Yeah, that was a trick question. <laughs> no, it's Palm Sunday. Sorry, I need to be more clear. It, the answer you think is going to be the right one, uh, unless it's not. It's Palm Sunday. Um, so Palm Sunday, I love. It's the story of Jesus coming into Jerusalem, right? You've, you've heard it since you were little kids, if you came to church when you were little kids. That's, a, that's an ace in the whole little kid Sunday lesson, right? Um, and I love it because there's so many different ways to talk about it. Like, so, like the, a way that's talked about over and over again uh, is that it's the people welcoming and celebrating the coming of Jesus, right? It's like that's, the, that's the most regular way to talk about it. But that story is like a gym, and, every, and you can turn it in so many different ways, and the more you turn it, the more lessons come out of it, right? Like another way to turn that story is to look at it. It's Jesus entering Jerusalem for the first time, right? It's Jesus entering the historic site of God's people, and he's been circling around it, and he's been teaching around it in all the ways that it's not living up to its expectations. And finally, on Palm Sunday, he's entering right into the heart of the story, right? He's, in, he's entering ground zero. He's coming to the place that has the control and the power, and he's coming to teach it, to usurp it, to change it, right? All of a sudden, you can turn that facet. There's a whole different aspect of that story. Uh, there's another aspect of that story that I just love, and that people are, are yelling, Hosanna, Hosanna, God saves us, and what they're cheering for, the reason that they're celebrating and waving the palm branches, because they think he's a coming, conquering king, right? He's a Jewish leader. He's the Messiah. He's the one they believe in, and they're under threat and owned by someone else who's come in and taken over and holds them down with violence and threats, and they think, here's the king who's come to save us, right? And so they're cheering and celebrating because he's going to rescue them and set them free, but what he's actually come to do is to teach them humility and mercy, compassion, and sacrifice. That's not the kind of king that they wanted, and so when you turn that story over in that direction and look at it, there's a reason why they went from cheering him to yelling, crucify him in just seven days, because he's not the kind of king that they wanted, right? That's a whole other facet of that story. You can turn it over again, and you can realize that in their communities, a whole other facet is that owned by the Roman Empire, being held and subjugated and colonized by them, one of the ways that Roman people of greatness would celebrate is something called a triumph, right? And they would enter town uh, through the western side of the city, and they would come in on white horses and a big parade. And when you think of, like, the opening scenes of Aladdin, Prince Ali, fabulousy, Ali Ababa, let's sing. Uh, so... <laughs> That's, what they would, that's how they would enter town, right? This big triumph to show all their power. And Jesus, the one who's more powerful than anyone else could ever hope to be, enters from the other side of town on a borrowed donkey, right? It's an act of political theater. Like, you think power is like this? I'll show you power is like that. And so incredibly different. And so one of the things I love is when you turn that story over, a whole other facet keeps coming out. So uh, that's what's happening with me in Christmas right now. And the reason I gave you that whole background is there's something I've been just like turning over in my mind and I cannot get enough of when I think about Christmas, when I think about God coming to us in Jesus, when I think about the Christ event over and over again this year, there's something that has been just like living in my brain that I can't stop thinking about. And the reason I gave you all that backdrop is because I want to I'm introduce a facet to Christmas you may not have thought about before, but it's the thing that I'm passionate about. And I'm really worried that I'm going to get done with this in 25 minutes, and y'all are going to go, that was the Christmas sermon? <laughs> uh, and so that's why I gave you this whole, like, this is a facet of the story you might not have thought about. But it's the facet that actually absolutely has my soul on fire right now, and so I'm just kind of trusting that maybe it's better to preach from what you're passionate about than just do the same old, same old. And what I'm passionate about right now is the idea of the Jesus event right, the incarnation of Christ, Emmanuel, God with us, as this interplay between power and vulnerability. Bill, uh-oh. <laughs> you know what I should do? I should create an environment where I have to spell in front of people. Our text is going to be in Isaiah today. Isaiah 9, chapter 2. Uh, I mean, chapter 9, verses 2 through 7. So I've been talking over and over again about Isaiah this entire time. And uh, remember that the backdrop of Isaiah is a time of hopelessness. 
It is uh, a community of people, the kingdom of Judah, that on its northern borders are the biggest, baddest empire they've ever run up against, who uh, before too long are going to take over, who are going to come in, are going to tear them up, are going to kill them, are going to take many of them away. And so this background is this period of hopelessness, and Isaiah is a prophet, meaning a person who speaks God's will to God's people, and he's speaking to the kings in charge over and over again, and what he's trying to get them to understand is in the midst of what seems hopeless to you, in the midst of what seems like a time where there's no way you can possibly win, where you're scrambling, where you're selling out every value you have just to try to make it, in the midst of all of this, I promise you it's not hopeless. Trust in God. I promise you it's not hopeless. Just stay Engage to stay with God through all of this, right? This is what Isaiah is saying. Uh, in verse 2 through 7, this has become of a part of a larger theme, but it's actually a hymn. He breaks out into song in the midst of delivering this prophecy. And the Christian community uh, that came to read this 700 years later looked back at this text and went, oh my goodness, Isaiah had no idea that when he was talking about this, he was also talking about something so much bigger that would come later. These are the words that he sang. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in a pitch dark land, light has dawned. You have made the nation great. You have increased its joy. They rejoiced before you as with joy at the harvest, as with those who divide, who div divide plunder rejoice. As on the day of Midian, you've shattered the yoke that burdened them, the staff on their shoulders and the rod of their oppressor. Because every boot of the thundering warriors and every garment rolled in blood will be burned. Fuel for the fire. A child is born to us. A son is given to us. And authority will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be vast authority and endless peace for David's throne and for his kingdom. Establishing and sustaining it with justice and righteousness now and forever. The zeal of the Lord of heavenly forces will do this. God speaks to us through the reading of scripture. Thanks be to God. So what Isaiah is talking about in this prophecy is a mass that our borders is a bigger army that has more wealth, that has more people, that has more wel weapons, that has better generals, that wins over and over and over again. And it looks obvious that we need to be terrified. It looks obvious that we're going to be crushed. Uh, it looks obvious that there's no hope and no future for us. And what uh, he's saying is that's not the case. That's not what God is up to. That's not what God is going to do, right? Um, and what he's forecast, when he talks about uh, Midian and all that, those are references to previous things that God has done, right? Previous situations that seemed like this, and what we saw was God intervening into the story of God's people, and in the face of insurmountable odds, they survive. They flourish. They, they overcome over and over and over again. Um, which, which it's a promise of incredible display of power and authority, right? And what we have in the Christian story what we have at, at Christmas Day, what we have at the Incarnation, uh, what we have at the birth of Jesus Christ is God entering the story in a decisive way, right? We have God entering the story in a way that changes the future forever. We have God showing up in a way that had never happened before that we couldn't possibly hope for and expect. We have God displaying God's power and God's authority in a way that has never been seen before, right? God enters the story through Jesus Christ to permanently alter the trajectory of the world, an amazing display of power and authority. And how does God do that? Through a grown man? Through armies? God does it through a child. God does it through a child. So um, one of the things I've shared really uh, regularly with you guys throughout um, the, s the service that started before the gathering and through the gathering is that I haven't been a Christian my entire life. I've been exposed to Christianity through my entire life, um, but I wasn't um, a Christian until my early adulthood as the result of a season of really like looking and, and searching and trying to find something. And when I, was, uh, when I was looking and searching for something and I ended up finding it in Christianity, I wasn't looking for, uh, I wasn't just looking for like a nice little thing to do on Sunday mornings when it's cold outside. It's not the, e it's not the easiest way to get kolaches. There's easier ways to get kolaches. <laughs> um, I wasn't looking to just fit in into community. I wasn't just looking for friendship. Um, I wasn't just looking for like a nice little collections of moral codes to be a good person. Um, I was, I was looking to change the world, right? I was looking for something worth dying for. 
I was looking for the one true story. I was looking for the everything, not a little something, right? And I found that in Christianity. And one of the things uh, that really just changed everything for me was learning that Jesus' words, Jesus' first words when he shows up on the scene aren't, okay, have a personal relationship with me and be a nice person and wait out the clock until you die, right? That's not Jesus' announcement. Jesus' announcement is change your heart and lives. The coming of God's kingdom is at hand. Change your hearts and lives. The coming of God's kingdom is at hand. The coming of the order of the world that is united in hope, joy, expectation of something good, family, love, generosity, celebration, happiness. The kingdom of God is at hand. He's come to announce it. He's come to make it happen. He's come to make it clear. The world that's run by racism, greed, poverty, disease, violence, war, apathy, drugs, abuse, grief, despair, and hopelessness is over, he announces. Be a part of that. Join with me. Include, what's, include yourself in what's going on here, right? The God of everything, the God who created the world, the God who breathed humanity into being has finally reached a place where that God is with us in the flesh, and you can join in that. God has exercised God's power and authority in an incredible way. Be with it. And I said yes, because I wanted to be with that. And the number one thing that I think about over and over and over again, is that God's incredible display of power, God entering the story in a way that's never happened before and could never happen again, God fundamentally entering the story and saying, this is changing now. That incredible expression of power, right? How did God do that? God did it in the middle of nowhere, a little backwater town, nowhere from no place, Bethlehem, nothing right? And he does, he, does he do it to someone who has a lot of power and authority and prestige in a community? Probably to a 14-year-old girl, so scared, so unprepared, to a family that has no money, that has no prestige, that has no honor. God enters the story there. Does God enter as a conquering king? Does God enter with swords? Does God enter with money? Does God enter with the kind of power that we're used to? God enters our story in the midst of all of our fighting, in the midst of all of our hatred, in the midst of all of our bickering, in the midst of all of our trying to get more power for ourselves, God enters vulnerable. That's how God enters the story. And God in Jesus, over and over again, throughout his entire life, when at every point people are trying to shove a sword into his hand, right? At every point when people are trying to get him to describe who's in and who's out, when at every point people are begging Jesus to exercise the kind of power that they want him to exercise over and over and over again, he chooses vulnerability. He chooses openness. He chooses acceptance. He chooses willingness to be with others on their terms over and over and over again. And that's how he exercises his power up to and through the cross. Jesus exercises the ultimate power by willing to accept the, world, the worst that the world could do to him. And then one of the things that we're going to talk about over and over again uh, throughout the course of our study of Revelation, in, uh, in Revelation, one of the best images that we see uh, and it happens over and over and over again. We see a world that's in chaos, right? And we see dragons, and we see armies, and we see death, and we see disease, and we see despair. And over again, John of Patmos, in his vision of revelation that he shared with us, he says, the conquering force of God, the work of God that made all of this okay, the work of God that was so powerful that it saved all of your souls, no matter what could happen, the work of God was done in the, la the lamb who was slain and is yet standing. That's the thing that conquers. That's the thing that wins. That's the, thi that's the thing that is ultimately powerful. God's power is expressed in that vulnerability. So we call Jesus the Prince of Peace in this text, right? We've heard that before. Jesus as the Prince of Peace. This was happening in a time in the Roman world. There's something called the, the Pax Romana. Y'all remember that from high school history? No? Bad high school. Okay, we gotta do better. <laughs> Um, I think we had like a whole week on that. We had an entire year of Texas history um, and then a week of the Pax Romana. Uh, this was this, this, this multi-hundred year uh, time of peace, right, that was celebrated throughout the Roman kingdom, uh, the Roman Empire. And the Pax Romana was peace as enforced by the sword. 
Pax Romana was the kind of peace you get when you have the army that's big enough and no one will try to assault you. The Pax Romana was the kind of peace that you get when you go in and kill all the people who are willing to resist you, and at the end, ah, peace. Pax Romana was the kind of peace that you get when you have more money, when you have more power, when you have more prestige, and everyone is scared of you. That was the kind of peace that they understood in the world at that time. And when they announced the coming of the Prince of Peace, it's an entirely different kind of peace. It's the kind of peace that's made not in preparedness for war, but in preparedness to absorb whatever the other can throw at you. Do you realize how ultimately powerful that is? There's a kind of power that says, I can stomp you. I can beat you. I can win. I can out politically argue in our company, and I can get people with bigger titles and more money and bigger cars to believe in me than believe in you. I can beat you that way. I can beat you by, by saying the things that will hurt you and cut down your self-esteem and make you believe that I win. I can beat you that way. That's a certain kind of power. Am I right? In Christmas, in Jesus' life, in the crucifixion, in the resurrection, we see that the strongest kind of power, the most ultimate form of power, is power as expressed in vulnerability. I can enter this story in the midst of strife, and hopelessness, and loss, vulnerable. That I can take the slings and arrows of your words, I can take the violence of your body, I can take existing with nothing and being exposed, I can take crucifixion, I can take whatever you throw at me. And ultimately, we're still going to win. Still going to conquer through peace. Still going to win through hope. You can throw death, you can throw violence, you can throw hate. And God expresses this power that says, no, I'm actually going to show you how great I am by being vulnerable, by being in your midst, by being to thro- take whatever you throw at me and letting you know that I still love you, that I'm still here, that the promises are still good. That's what I'm thinking about over and over this Christmas. That's weird, right? That's weird. I, I acknowledge it. That's not the normal Christmas sermon you're going to get. Uh, normally you're going to get the Savior was born. That's amazing, and it is. But I can't stop thinking about the Savior was born in poverty. The Savior was born in the middle of nowhere. The Savior experienced rejection over and over again. The Savior was nailed to a tree. We killed him. And still, in the midst of all that, the Savior showed us what it was to really have power. And that was to love and to trust and to care enough to be vulnerable. So uh, I want to ask you, what needs changing in your world what needs changing in your world? What needs overcoming in your world? What's the battle in your world? What's the person that you just so badly want to fight? What's the person that you so badly want to circle up against? What's the person you want to take up arms against? Are they at your office? Are they at your neighborhood? Are they on your television screen? Are they at your Christmas dinner table? <laughs> that one hit. <laughs> Who's the person? that, uh, who's the person that makes you just want to fight? Who's the person that makes you just want to fight? It's always people, right? We can say they're systems, we can say they're things, but at the end of the day, it's the racist person. It's the greedy person, right? It's the cancer cell. At the end of the day, uh, it's something. It's something. Christmas is the time where we realize that the greatest power in the world is the willingness to be vulnerable. It's the willingness to be open. That's the kind of power that ultimately can conquer bigotry. That's the kind of power that ultimately can resist empire. That's the kind of power that ultimately can conquer death. That's what God does at Christmas. God shows us the way. Let's try to follow it. Please pray with me. Loving God, On Christmas, you enter the story. On Christmas, you join your people. On Christmas, you declare that you are with us, then, now, and forever. Open our hearts, God, to seeing that when you choose to come to us, you do so in weakness. What does that teach us? You do so in vulnerability. What does that show us? You do so with trust. What does that mean to us? God, change us. Shape us. Fill us with your love. 
and let us share that with a world that so desperately needs it. And it's in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, that we try to follow, that we try to listen, that we try to learn, and that we always pray. Saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Not just on Christmas Day, not just on Easter Day, but every time we gather together as a community, uh, we recognize that um, God's making a lot of big promises to us, right? God makes so many promises to us. Uh, God asks so much of us in return, uh, and sometimes that's hard. Sometimes it's hard to trust. Sometimes it's hard to follow. Sometimes it's hard to know, and uh, one of the ways that helps us trust and follow and know more than any other is the sacrament of communion. Uh, I'm going to invite our assistants to come up uh, and come forward, please. Uh, Communion is a special sacrament. It's a special time. It's a special opportunity to encounter uh, the God who promises to be with us, amongst us, and for us. From the night that Jesus was to have dinner with his disciples for the very last time, they were meeting in the upper room in Jerusalem, and he knew this was going to be it. And so after the, or during the course of the dinner, he took a piece of bread, blessed it, gave thanks over it, and then he broke it. And he said, take all of you and eat, for this is my body, which has been broken for you. And after the meal was over, he took a cup of ordinary table wine, gave thanks over it, blessed it, and passed it, knowing what was coming. He said, take all of you and drink, for this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so we do it often in remembrance of him, him who promises to be with us, him who promises to be for us, him who entered the story in humility him who entered the story in vulnerability, him who entered the story in peace. When we celebrate Holy Communion, uh, I want to do so with a reminder, this is not the gathering table. This is not the First United Methodist Church's table. This is Christ's table. It is open to all people. It is open to all people regardless of whether you're a member of this church or any other church. It's open to all people regardless of where you've been or where you're from. Nothing in the world could possibly make you worthy of God's grace, and by the same time, nothing you could ever do could make you unworthy. We celebrate communion by coming forward in two aisles right here down the center, you go row by row. We have two stations set up on each side. So if there's someone at the first station, but the second station is open, just go over to that one. It helps us get through really quickly. Uh, when you come forward, you come with your hands held open like this. A piece of bread is uh, taken out, put in your hands. You then take it, dip it in the chalice, uh, and then eat it and return to your seat for a time of silent prayer. We always celebrate communion with non-alcoholic grape juice because we don't want anyone to have to choose between the sacrament and uh, sobriety. Uh, so the meal is set. The table is ready. It's here for you. The promises of Christmas are here for you. The grace of Christ is here for you. The promises of the sacrament and the table are here for you. It's set. It's ready. Come forward. Be fed.
That was the Christmas sermon? <laughs> uh, thank you so much for joining us. So that'll be it for the next couple weeks. We will resume the gathering on January 8th. Uh, I pray that all of you have a happy and safe and warm holiday season. Uh, just a reminder, we have a ton going on at Christmas Eve, so make sure to think about those services and how to get here uh, in a way that's not stressful and so it's a chance of worship for you and your family. And then come watch me be stressed, because it's a very busy day. Um, as a reminder, as we're coming up to our time of close today, there's a lot of stuff on the chairs. If you could please uh, help us by uh, picking them up and taking them to the back table. We turn this room over really quickly into another service of worship, and that really helps. Uh, also, if this is your first time joining us, we have a gift for you on the back. Uh, a cup of coffee, because obviously that's kind of our thing. Uh, and then a power charger for your cell phone with a link to our podcast. God bless y'all. Uh, and just a reminder that this service is streamed online, and you can always catch up with it uh, on the internet afterwards if you need to. Uh, so now, um, in that spirit, please bow your head and receive this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May God's face raise to shine upon you. And may you, the people of God, follow in the example of Christ and shine God's light in the world everywhere you go. Amen. Be blessed. Merry Christmas.